would, I'd like to talk on the subject of gratitude on this, this weekend before Thanksgiving. And, and my first reaction was, how am I going to talk for 45 minutes on gratitude? Um, I've done a couple of talks here before, um, mainly on a scientific basis, which is what really interests me. I'm not saying that spiritism doesn't interest me, but uh, giving a talk, uh, I was a little, little concerned. Um, but really, over these last uh, six weeks, I've researched into this. And yesterday I was doing the final touches of the presentation and I was faced with the challenge of what I had to take out to manage to get it all into 45 minutes. So I hope I succeed. Um, as you can see, the, the topic is gratitude and I've ended the, the phrase is the best attitude. And as I hope to show you today, um, one can actually cultivate and develop an attitude of gratitude. And it's something that has tremendous benefits in life, both from a psychological, physical, emotional points of view, and I hope I'll be able to demonstrate that in the talk. So let's go forward and try and look at what is the definition of gratitude. Um, a lot of us, when we hear the word gratitude, we think of thanksgiving and worship and prayer, but those are all external uh, outcomes of having an internal feeling of gratitude, and that is a big difference. So gratitude is a feeling, an acknowledgement of a benefit, expanding that further, it's a sense of thankfulness and joy in response to receiving a gift, whether you deserve it or not, whether it's concrete or abstract, uh, to a gesture of kindness. And I'm using two, two books basically today for a lot of the material that I put together. The first one is this book by Robert Emmons. He's a, a psychologist at the uh, University of California, Davis. He's been working on this subject for like more than 10 years, <coughs> written a series of books. In the third part of my talk, we're going to come back to him. But I'd like to start off by uh, taking some words from the opening chapters. Um, what is gratitude? Because he puts it so succinctly. I tried to put it in bullets, and I decided I wasn't doing him justice. So I just pulled out some of the phrases that I think really uh, give us the idea of what, what is gratitude. So gratitude can be a moment of at oneness that is evoked in the presence of natural beauty or in the science of the soul. A moment when the world, both in its abundance and its challenges, make perfect, perfect sense, when its gifts can be seen and appreciated in whatever wrappings they come in. I just love this last phrase because we often look at the good things in life and it's often the challenges that we don't recognize at the time that provide the greatest learning opportunities. Gratitude can also be a conscious, rational choice to focus one's life on its blessings rather than its shortcomings. It can be developed into a spiritual practice to create a positive outlook on life. It is a feeling, a moral attribute, a virtue, a mystical experience, and a conscious act all in one. And again, a conscious rational choice. We have the, the choice to be gra grateful, um, and it's something we should you know, bear in mind. Gratitude is a universal human experience that can be either a random occurrence of grace or an attitude chosen to create a better life. Again, the same phrase. At other times, it is our companion during our darkest moments, causing us to be grateful for the good in the midst of tragedy, encouraging us to believe that good can come when we cannot understand our own suffering or the suffering of others. There are times that gratitude comes over us in a wave, lifting, up higher, lifting us up higher than we can normally stand, and then setting us down on our feet after bringing closer to God. And finally, this is very interesting, there's a paradoxical aspect to the gratitude as well. The more grateful we are, the more reasons we have to be grateful. Um, I'd like to just do a little exercise with you all, if you don't mind. If you could just close your eyes and just think about what happened to you today from waking up. Maybe the kids jumped up, maybe the alarm went off, I don't know. But whatever happened, getting dressed, having breakfast, coming here to the center. I'd like you all to just close your eyes. And the first thing that comes into your head that you're grateful of, just reflect on it. Think it through. And really feel that moment of gratitude. Okay, well that's something we should all be doing more often and I think, as, again, as the talk goes on, I hope to show you the value that this sort of exercise can do to us. So the object of the talk, um, to explore the topic of gratitude through religious and spiritist teachings as well as modern positive psychology. And this is again the work of Robert, uh, Robert Emmons, who we'll come on to later. To demonstrate how an attitude of gratitude can have a positive impact on our daily lives. And it's in, I've basically got the material arranged in three parts. Uh, gratitude through the ages, I'm calling the first part. Then the spiritist perspective. 
And finally, the positive uh, psychology of gratitude. So starting with the first part, um, gratitude through the ages. T <laughs> this is interesting because teaching and developing of gratitude are common components of most religious traditions. Uh, I confess that um, I've always been very skeptical of the formal tradition uh, religions and partly because I see so many conflicts in the world. It's so easy to see the differences between religions. But one aspect that does is a common thread for all religions is this developing gratitude. And spirituality and gratitude, uh, although not dependent on each other, studies show that spirituality does enhance a person's ability to be grateful. And vice versa too. A more grateful person is more of a spirit spiritual person. It's viewed as a prize of propensity in all the major religions. And because of that, it's a common theme. Worship and gratitude to God is common throughout all our, uh, the established religions. And it, it permeates the text. Um, you know, the, obviously the Bible, but the Quran, the Torah, the, court, the uh, Torah, all of the basic religious texts all have a, a lot of worshiping and praying to God. And it's the most common emotion that religions aim to provoke and maintain within us. And you could call it a universal religious sentiment. So just quickly going through some of the religions. Hinduism, um, again, it's a religion, one of the, old, the oldest religion, um, and still one of the most uh, populous in terms of the number of followers. Um, a lot of said in, in Hinduism about um, uh, reincarnation, sort of parallels between spiritism. But here are a couple of phrases that I found within some of the Hinduist writings. Um, some people complain because God put thorn among roses. Others praise him for putting roses among thorns. Feeling gratitude and not expressing it is like wrapping a present and not giving it. So again, this whole idea of having the feeling and expressing it. Appreciation of beautiful, soulful quality, available for everyone in every circumstance. Being thankful for life's little treasures, grateful for the opportunity to begin the day where you are, appreciating the perfect place for your karma, and God's grace that has brought to you, brought you to. Um, Buddhism, just a quote from the Dalai Lama, which I think is very appropriate. Every day I think as you wake up, today I'm fortunate to be alive. I have a precious human life. I'm not going to waste it. I'm going to use all my energies to develop myself, to expand my heart out to others, to achieve enlightenment through the benefit of all beings. I'm going to have kind thoughts towards others. I'm not going to have uh, get angry or think badly about others. I'm going to benefit others as much as I can. Very noble. I wish we could hold that every day, right? In the Jewish religion, there's a lot, obviously, about praising uh, God for giving them the promised land, and it's, it's a very big part of the, the, the prayers of the Jewish. But I've pulled out here a little story, which I think is interesting. Maybe some of you have already heard it, but I'm still going to tell you it again, because it's worthwhile. Um, there is a story frequently told of a farmer whose horse ran away and the neighbors all cried, oh, what bad luck. The farmer replied, it may be bad luck, or it may be good luck, I don't know. The following day, the horse returned and brought a herd of wild horses with him. The same neighbor exclaimed, what good fortune, now you have a stable filled with horses. The farmer shared the same reply as the day before, it might be good luck, maybe not. Several days later, the farmer's son was out in the field when one of the horses threw him off, breaking his leg. The neighbor moaned, what bad luck has come your way? And the farmer, of course, replied, it may be bad luck or it may be good luck, I cannot say. When the government declared war, there was a draft of all the young men in the town. The father's son was excluded from the draft because he'd broken his leg and avoided going to war. The farmer said to his neighbors, now I see that losing my horse was a good thing. So again, you reflect on the good things in life. And a little bit of uh, Islam. Gratitude to Islam is one of the most fundamental aspects of this religion. The Muslim is not merely one cognizant of the <coughs> fact that the creator of the universe is one and responsible for everything he has in his life, i.e. his consciousness, his health, his family, his sanity, and his wealth. But he also realizes that his obligation to express, express gratitude to the Lord. The Arabic word for gratitude is shuk, and the opposite is kuf, <laughs> which also happens to be the word for disbelief. So rejection of Allah and his religion is ultimately connected to ungratefulness. Um, I'd like to 
finalize this section with, oh, Christianity, sorry, I'm jumping a the slide there. Um, Christianity in, in the Bible is obviously full of gratitude, worshiping to God. I just, this is the quote from the Last Supper, and I think you all know that, so let's move on to our next topic, which is Proverbs. Um, Proverbs are simple and concrete sayings, properly known and repeated, that express a truth based on common sense or the practical experience of humanity. They're also metaphorical. So they're really the layman's Bible, I like to look at it that way. And a lot of the Proverbs carry very uh, messages that are really in, in line and in tune with what we're talking about today. Uh, Proverbs are often bor bor borrowed from similar languages and cultures and sometimes come down to the present through more than one language. I, when I lived in Brazil and started to learn Portuguese, still learning, um, so it's amazing how many uh, proverbs in English are also common in Portuguese. Maybe some slight variations, but the, the message behind them is the same. And the Bible, uh, and, and a lot of writings in medieval Latin, played a considerable role in distributing proverbs across Europe. Um, cultures that treat the Bible as a major spiritual book contain between three and five hundred proverbs. This uh, Wolfgang Meider is a, a professor in um, Virginia, and is probably the world's expert on Proverbs. He's a linguist and has studied Proverbs extensively. So, the first one I've got here is, when you drink from a stream, remember the spring. This is a Chinese proverb. Um, and at first sight, what's, what is that to do with gratitude? But the idea is, you know, if you drink from a stream, a stream is not only refreshing, cold, refreshing water, but it's also the life we need as, as a human race. And remember means to think, to be aware of where that water came from. So the problem there is really directing us to be aware and to be grateful for what we have. Uh, similarly, don't look a gift horse in the mouth, we all know that one. Like this one, loose teeth are better than no teeth. Um, this, one I, this, this one I always remember. My father used to say this to me so many times, and every time I have bad luck now, I always feel, remember this proverb. I felt sorry for myself because I had no shoes until I met a man with no feet. It's all relative. Life is all relative. The happiest of people don't necessarily have the best thing of everything. They just make the most of everything. If you can read this, thank a teacher. There is no one luckier than he who thinks so himself. You have to think about that one, that's quite interesting. There is no one luckier than one who thinks himself so. If you see no reason for giving thanks, the fault lies in yourself. One generation plants the trees, another gets the shade. When I count my blessings, I count you twice. Who does not think for little will not thank for much. So any other proverbs I've missed? Come on, somebody must have a proverb here to do with gratitude. Anybody? No? Okay, let's move on. So that basically finishes the first part. Um, and now we're going to move on to gratitude and spiritism. And in preparing for this talk, I obviously looked at the three major books by Allan Kardec. I, um, and I spent some time going through the index of each of these books, looking up chapters to try and find some material that I could put into the talk. And last week I, I called Andrea and asked her, because I know she's got the electronic copies, and I asked her to look in those three books and see how many times the word grateful was in these three books. Um, Susanna, have a guess. Think of a number. <laughs> Anybody? Well, the answer is once one word in the Spirit's book, four in the Gospel, and one in Genesis. And that's surprising. Yeah, I, I would find that very surprising. I also find it, wow, what am I going to talk about now? Because I can't, I can't refer to the, you know, question number 364 of the Spirit's book says. However, however, that being said, he does, Alan Kardec does talk a lot about ingratitude. And that's often the case in, in, in spiritual literature, spiritist literature, that this duality of vices and virtues. So, you know, there's a lot of references to um, uh, ingratitude in those three books. But looking into the Spirit's book, I did find some things that uh, I find in line with the talk today. And in part three, the moral laws, where the 12 moral laws are laid out. Um, the chapter two, the law of worship, there's three questions here. He talks about the purpose of worship and the Spirit's answer. It is a lifting up of thought towards God and draws the soul nearer to the Creator. And again, 
I like the emphasis on thought, the internal um, aspect of gratitude. The need for outward expression, we're talking prayer. True worship comes from the heart, was the answer. Again, internal. And character of prayer. Prayer is an act of worship, communication with God. It goes on to say, through prayer we may do three things. Praise, act, and thank. And in part four, uh, hopes and consolations. He talks about earthly joys and sorrows. Nine, question 937, ungratefulness. Ingratitude is the, only is the child of selfishness and selfish individuals will sooner or later encounter hearts as hard as their own. And he goes on to say, serves to test your persistence in doing good. Uh, in the Gospel, at the section at the end of the Gospel, there is a lot of prayers, starting with the Lord's Prayer, and other special prayers for special occasions. But prior to the chapter, he has a preamble. Um, talking about prayer. The form that means nothing, the thought is everything. Pray according to your convictions and the manner that touches you the most. A good thought is worth many, more, many words that are for, more, more than many words that are foreign to you. Again, it's, prayer is, uh, the importance is not what you say, the word you use, but the feeling that goes behind it. And this one particular prayer, there's a prayer for thanksgiving, favour received. One must not only consider matters of great importance as ha happy events. Those least in appearance are often the ones that have the most influence in our destiny. People easily forget the good and remember especially what afflicts them. If we will recall every day the benefits we have received without ever asking for them, we will be surprised at the number that has slipped our memory and we will be humbled by our ingratitude. So, in the gospel, in Genesis, uh, again difficult, but uh, in Providence, when we become in contact with the divine providences, that does all it can on our behalf. The most enlightened and evolved we will become, the greater this inner feeling of gratitude that truly connects to the Creator, as to the Creator. So, one of the sources, the second major book that I found that helped me prepare for this talk is The Psychology of Gratitude, uh, Devaldo Franco, Psychograph by Devaldo Franco, uh, by the Spirit, and the Spirit was Joanna de Angelis. Um, it's a really a beautiful book. It is very, I found it very, for want of a better word, hard going. It's very complex. The, the language, the literature is, is spectacular, but it's very difficult to understand. Maybe Sherry could give us a, a have you read it by the way, Sherry? I have. Well, I'm sure you'd find it very, very interesting. Um, I, I focus on the first chapter. There's about seven chapters, but the first chapter I read and read and reread. And again, I'm not, rather than trying to summarize it, I'm just going to pull out some of the phrases that she talks about in this, uh, in this opening chapter. Gratitude stand out as one of the most relevant among the noble sentiments that characterize a psychologically mature individual. So again, as we mature, we become our aptitude to gratitude does grow with us. All who are grateful, who truly understand the significance of real gratitude, enjoy physical, emotional and psychological health because they are content in living and sharing all things and they are active participants in the social organization, creative and joyous. Again, this, and this is coming from Joanna DeAngelis, this uh, benefit of feeling emotional. It does have real attributes, real <coughs> benefits in life. Yet it is ingratitude, the ungracious daughter of arrogance, that is the predominant thought within the masses. Consequently, ungrateful individuals live restlessly and in perturbation, for they cultivate the parasitic infirmities of aggression, violence, self-compassion, and engage in many mechanisms of transference of responsibility. Pretty heavy going, but I'm sure when... I don't think we're, we're, anybody's really born with ingratitude. We all have different levels of gratitude that we... We normalize around, some days we have more gratitude, some days we have less. But I don't think anybody really has total ingratitude about life. Maybe a psychopath or some extreme cases. Um, this I found a little heavy going, that one. Okay, so after the opening part of the first chapter, she has three sections. One is the significance of gratitude. The repetitive pattern of receiving assistance and protection through fetal development until the adult phase without the awareness of what is being offered, is responsible for building the ego, which is interested solely in the ability to, to rejoice without great responsibilities. And I, I, when I read this, I you know, recall bringing up my children, and uh, 
how, how we have that dichotomy of trying to help and care and love our children, but also teach that responsibility. I think this, this brings it out here, that how a child can be very, very egoistic you know, until they develop the emotions. Uh, so as, as instinct opens up to emotions, love rehearses its first steps and kindness towards others. Love shows itself at this stage by means of an eagerness to serve, contribute and gratify. The more one develops one affects his feelings, the more one sense of reciprocity recept right? becomes. Gratitude is like a beacon of light in its speed as it crosses over expanses and spontaneously illuminates its entire oath all along without being deterred by the incandescent beam that signals its own importance. One reaches emancipating individuation when one is grateful. Nevertheless, such a state is only achieved through a long, fascinating and challenging journey. So it's not the destination, it's the journey that counts. In the second part, she talks about life and gratitude. And she refers to Jung. Uh, Substantiate the objective of life is not the acquisition of happiness, but rather search for its meaning, its significance. The meaning of existence, the transpersonal significance, is more important than the sensation that derived from possessions and pleasure. In contrast, the existential significance, its meaning, is characterized by self-assessment, moral and intellectual transformation of the individual before life, and deployment of time and the identification of the self with the ego. Thereby one sees what, that gratitude is also a form of existential significance, a meaning for life, which very few people know how to apply to their emotional growth. And finally, the last part of this chapter, <coughs> the awareness of gratitude. The ability for gratitude is acquired more easily as the sight develops the conscience while making it overcome the primitive, primitive levels that are permeated by the shadow. At the virtuous levels of the self and the cosmic conscience, exaltation halos round, round gratitude and the sentiments no longer remain subjected to I or my but expand to we, you and I, and all of us together. Gratitude is God's signature appended into his creation, onto its creation. External, external peace starts with each one of us, each one of, and so it is with gratitude. Instead of fear accepting it, let one be spontaneous donor and become cured of the blemishes while rehearsing generalized harmony. Life without gratitude is sterile and void of ex ex existential meaning. So, pretty, uh, pretty heavy going, but uh, I, I would encourage you to read the book, if, as particularly the first chapter. I want to uh, shift gears a little bit now after that rather heavy going there. I'm going to show you a video. Um, this video was made by uh, um, a young uh, software engineer from Silicon Valley. And in his mid-20s he decided he was very frustrated with life. So he sold everything he had and he started traveling around the world. And um, he would send these postcards, as he called them, which were actually videos. And he started to do this little dance, um, just for fun. So he had a, you know, a video of him dancing in front of the Opera House and then the Taj Mahal and all around. And when he, eventually his money ran out and he came back to the States, he put it all together and made a proposal and actually got sponsors to repeat this in a more professional way. Uh, and this is the result. It's about a four minute video. but when. When you watch this video, I think the things that I appreciate and grateful for in the video is amazing diversity of the, the natural beauty and the man-made beauty in the world, um, amazing diversity of the, the cultures we have, because as he does these dances, what he starts dancing with the people of the, the locale. And uh, finally, the music is um, it's a beautiful piece of music. It's in Bangladesh, so we're not going to understand the letters, but uh, the words but it's about joy, it's the joy of living. So we know what to say, let's watch the video. If you want to get up and dance, by the way, please feel free. <laughs>
I love this guy here. I love the way this guy dances, huh? <laughs> he has a website called wherethehellismat.com. You can still find He's been doing this for four years now. So, Okay, so moving on. Um, the third part of the talk is about cultivating gratitude. And, and this comes from the, um, the movement of you know, positive psychology. Which, Sherry, correct me if I'm wrong, it started about the year 2000. Where, uh, there's a great movement to see what psychology could do to bring to increase the level of happiness in people rather than and again please correct me Sherry making miserable people less miserable through psychology what could psychology do to actually impact people's lives and again I'm going back to this book by Raymond Esmond, Edmonds he's wrote other books particularly this book by uh, called Thanks How Practicing Gratitude Can Make You Happy it's a very good book also um, <coughs> so we can explore several methods and let's look into the book First of all, before we do that, uh, I'm not going to do the exercise now, but I have some handouts here. Um, if you're really interested in trying to lift up your ex sensitivity to gratitude, it seems to do a little experiment where you can actually, using this questionnaire, measure your, measure your level of gratitude. So you know where you were before, and maybe in three months' time, try the exercise again to see if it does have an impact on you. Um, it's basically just six questions that you agree or strongly disagree. <coughs> Uh, answer them, add up the, the numbers. Okay, so techniques to enhance gratitude. And the first one is keeping a journal. Um, in fact, when I look back over these five weeks of doing this, I, I didn't keep a journal, but every day I was thinking and having ideas and going back to my presentation. And I felt the effects, so it's amazing how sensitive you become to 
the idea of gratitude. So keeping a journal is something very simple. Uh, every day write down three or four things that you're grateful for that happened that day. And try and keep that up for a few, period of a few weeks. And again, there are amazing effects. And Robert Emmons actually has done over a thousand experiments now where he has one group, let's say the group here on my right, who keep a positive uh, journal of things, that, good things that have happened to them. And then this group on the left keep a journal of things that the hassles of the day. You know, I can't find a parking place. It was poking when, pouring down when I came out of public yesterday. And things that really bothered you. And after a few weeks, um, he then went back to those two groups and, and did some measurements on them. And in fact, I've got a video here. Let me do, see if I can find that. Um, and I'll just let him speak for a few minutes. It's a 10 minute video he has. Uh... Right, so look at the last one, that one you talked about. Uh, you might think that'd be on the other list. This is I just setting up the, so let me just see if I can advance this on a little. For instance, more joy, more pleasure. Physically, those differences are roughly 25% increase over the people keeping the uh, hassle group. Comparison group. So all these are relative to the comparison group. In the domain of bodily functioning, we find that people who are keeping gratitude journals feel better about their health, their bother less by the aches and pains. They actually exercise more. They take better care of their health. Right? And the differences here range from 10 to 30 percent. In terms of sleep, we find a 10 percent increase in the sleep duration. When people are keeping the gratitude journals actually sleep 10 percent longer. Uh, and they wake up and they feel more fresh. So it's not that they're sleeping longer because they're depressed and they don't want to get up in the morning. They actually feel good, but they wake up more refreshed. So the, the restorative act of sleep is more efficient people when they're keeping gratitude journals. And the third domain is social relationships. And this is one where we're really expected to find something because that's all gratitude is the fact of social emotions or been referred to as a relationship strengthening emotion because it involves perceptions of being supported and affirmed by other people. They provide a benefit for us. That changes the nature of the relationship now between the individuals. And in fact, when people are keeping these journals, they're more sensitive to situations which they themselves can become helpful, outgoing, altruistic, pro-social, generous, compassionate, and so on. Less lonely, less isolated. So more positive social behaviors, fewer destructive social behaviors. So a variety of benefits in a variety of domains of keeping these journals that we've replicated now starting with initially with college students, but then replicating with people with a uh, physical chronic physical disease. Yeah. I'll, I'll stop it there. If you want to go, I can give you the reference to the side. He has actually three or four videos where he talks about the benefits of gratitude, the results of, of the gratitude exercises, and so on. Very, very worthwhile watching. So let me just go back to techniques of enhancing gratitude. We kept talked about keeping a journal. Uh, remember the bad. Um, that's not the good, bad, and the ugly. But remember the bad experience you had in life and how you got through with them, through them, and the end result. Ask yourself three questions: What have I received from? What have I given to? And what troubles and difficulties have I caused? Um, this is part of a Buddhist exercise um, to help you again sensitize you to the benefits of gratitude and helping, to, helping you to give gratitude. Prayers of gratitude we also talked about in the, um, uh, the gospel, according to spiritism. Come to your senses. That don't, doesn't mean uh, don't be stupid. That means be aware of your sight and sound and your physical senses, your five senses, or in some cases, six senses, should we say. But just be more aware of what's going around. Visual reminders. Um, uh, Robert has a story about a family that used to keep jars on the kitchen shelf because children particularly need some physical um, reminders. They have difficult, more difficulty conceptualizing things. So the family, whenever they had any loose change, they decided, well, should we put it in this jar for this reason or this jar for that reason or another jar? And when the jar was full, the family went out and gave that jar to someone who was really needed the money. And it's, a, again, a nice, a nice way of just being more conscious of the need for gratitude. Um, make a vow to practice gratitude, that's self-explanatory. Watch your language, that doesn't mean stop swearing, it means be more careful with your words to other people uh, and always thanking. And go through the motions, um, again, all the above. If you're very inventive, think outside the box. I'm sure there's other ways of improving gratitude. 
So that basically finishes my talk. Um, I'd just like to add that I really was, feel very grateful that I had the opportunity to put this together for you today. And I'm going to end um, with one last video. It's about a nine minute video, but it's a, it's a beautiful video and I think you'll enjoy it. It's moving art. It's by um, Luis Schwarzberg. He's a, a photographer. He does a lot of time lapse photography um, for more than the last 30, 40, 40 years. And he put together this video using his abundant uh, library of uh, visual art and uh, has a commentary, first starting with the child and then an old man who reflects on his life. And it is, I think, a very beautiful video to watch. When I watch TV, it's just some show that you just ever pretend. And, and when you explore, you get more imagination than you already have. And um, when you get more imagination, it makes you want to go deeper in so you can get more and see beautiful things. Like it could, the path, <laughs> this path, it could lead you to a beach or something. And it can be beautiful. Turn the light off. Turn the light off. No, Okay.
open your heart to the incredible gifts that civilization gives to us. You free persuasion, there is electric light. You turn a faucet and there is warm water and cold water. And drink of water. It's a gift that millions and millions in the world will never experience. So these are just a few of the enormous number of gifts to which we can open your heart. And so I wish you that you would open your heart to all these blessings and let them flow through you. That everyone who you will meet on this day will be blessed by you. Just by your eyes, by your smile, by your touch, just by your presence. Let the gratefulness overflow into blessing all around you. Then it will really be a good day.